Buckle up, boys. Today, it's going to be a madhouse in the comments section down below because we're theory crafting on the infantry combat overhaul. The infantry combat overhaul brings some new challenges to squad's gameplay. Most notably, it is a lot harder to move and shoot at the same time or to quickly transition from moving fast to shooting accurately. All of this is intentional on the part of OWI as made clear through the dev blogs that announced the ICO playtests and the ICO's release. The changes were intended to foster a new level of gameplay within the game. What the ICO has also done is made it a lot harder to attack as infantry. Before, attacking was like in any other FPS game, which meant running forward and then reactively shooting when you spotted an enemy. Tactics at most involved flanking to be able to catch enemies unawares or to engage enemies at a numerical advantage. This is no longer true. As you can see here, if I try to run and gun as I would have before the ICO, it's hard to shoot accurately. And if I try to move while ADS'd, eventually the wobble becomes crippling. In total, these changes make it much more complicated to attack effectively as infantry. So how do you attack effectively as infantry and squad? Questions like this are what I want to answer. Today, I will explain to you the premise behind real world fire and maneuver tactics, suppression, why these two concepts are relevant to squad post ICO, and then go over how to play the machine gunner and marksman kits. I'm going to be drawing from my knowledge of real world small unit tactics and from my knowledge of squad to explain some concepts and then translate those concepts to the game in a useful way. Combined with some examples to illustrate my points, this video should help explain how to be successful in squad in the attack after the infantry combat overhaul. Ultimately, I want squad to have a healthy community that is willing to work together as a team, exchange thoughts and ideas and to help teach those who are new. We have a long way to go, but my goal is that this video contributes to such a community. As I mentioned before, attacking in Legacy Squad was pretty simple. Like in any other FPS game, you ran forward and you reactively shot at enemies. Whoever got shots on target the fastest, the mostest, won. So all you needed to attack was good situational awareness and got to your aim. What OWI has done with the ICO is to make it so that those traditional FPS skills don't matter as much and there are other skills that are introduced into the mix. This is why you get all those guys on Reddit and Discord that are saying that the game sucks right now. And they're right, post ICO squad isn't great purely as an FPS game. But now, it's also much more than a mere FPS game. It's a tactics and strategy game played from the first person perspective that also includes new skills such as more important stamina management to set yourself up for future engagements, as well as suppression to introduce an element of non-lethal neutralization of enemies. So we talked about attacking in FPS games. In real world infantry attacks, the two functions of moving and shooting are divided up between two different elements that mutually support each other. This is called fire and maneuver. Fire and maneuver exists because, in short, a moving person is a bad shot, making moving and shooting at the same time a waste of ammunition. The basics of fire and maneuver can be applied in squad to conduct successful attacks post ICO, all the way from a two-player buddy team to a multi-squad team offensive. Let's run through an example real quick. Okay, so we're here in Pacific Proving Grounds. Say we've just landed here on this beach and we're trying to push up off the beach. And we think there are enemies behind this rock here. We can't just all run up together and then try and shoot those enemies as we see them because with the new ICO gun mechanics, we would just lose the gunfight and die. So we need to have some guys that are posted up and ready to cover us and shoot the enemy as they pop up while a different group of guys moves up and assaults this position. These two elements are called the assault element, the element that's moving up here, on, and the support element, the element that's staying back here to shoot at the bad guys. Now, if you're smart, you've already noticed a problem with the scheme. The problem is that in reality, by that I mean in squad, despite a support element being here, ready to shoot the bad guys, it's likely that the enemy will be able to pop out and have the time to fire off some shots. And that would kill a bunch of the guys in the assault element. Then your attack will have failed. Now, ignoring that in this example, the assault element would just be running in a straight line 
out in the open, this issue can be solved by suppression. As the support element, you can't just sit here waiting for targets to present themselves so that you can shoot them. So what you need to do is identify known and suspected enemy locations, then preemptively start shooting them to prevent the enemy from popping out and shooting at your teammates. If you do this well enough, the enemy won't be able to fire back at your guys. Achieving this state of perfection is called having fire superiority. It's easy to do this when you know where the enemy is. Maybe a squad mate calls out, he sees an enemy by the right side of this rock up on this hill. Then you can preemptively start to shoot at this known enemy location to deny him the ability to pop out and shoot your squad mates. Now, if you don't have prior information, what you can do is just look at this real quick and think to yourself, if I were the enemy, where would I put myself to defend this area? So you want to identify locations that provide cover, concealment, and good fields of fire. So these bushes here, are good sources of concealment if they are crouching. These rocks are good sources of cover and they also provide good fields of fire. So as you develop your attack, as you plan your attack, you can use your head a little bit and preemptively start shooting these suspected enemy locations. And as the situation develops and you get a better picture of where the enemy actually is because they will start shooting back, you can then adjust your fires and really try and gain and maintain fire superiority and if possible, kill the enemy. So that's what suppression is all about. A lot of people have this idea that suppressive fire is about just dumping fully automatic fire in the enemy's general direction. No. That's just ineffective fire and a supreme waste of ammunition. Suppressive fire requires some thinking to be effective, and you need to engage known and suspected enemy locations. Sometimes the best you have is a general direction, but then you need to determine the sources of enemy fire more specifically and communicate that to your team. Good suppression also needs teamwork and communication to work well. You need to distribute your fires to ensure that there's full suppression coverage on every enemy and that there aren't any gaps where an unsuppressed enemy can still return fire. When suppressing, accuracy is also important so that your bullets are close enough to actually have an effect. So suppression isn't some alternative form of shooting that doesn't have to be accurate and consists of everyone spraying and praying. No, you need to talk, work together, and aim your shots. And suppression also doesn't have to be fully automatic. Notice that I did all of my suppression here with single shots. And that's usually how it's done in real life with individual weapons. Okay, now that's all well and good, but real life theory and suppression do not translate to squad one for one. Many have rightly pointed this out and discussed it on Reddit, Discord, and YouTube. Nobody in game is actually going to cower in fear for their life just because I'm suppressing them. So the real life principle behind why suppression and by extension fire and maneuver works doesn't exist in the game. But what OWI has done is they made suppression actually have an in-game consequence through a heavy depth of field VFX blur effect, where if you get shot at, your vision goes blurry and you can't see the details of anything that's not right in front of your face. That's a very powerful in-game mechanic that lends very real value to suppression in squad. Suppressing someone may not stop them from poking their head out and shooting, no matter how many bullets are flying their way, but it will stop them from seeing clearly, quickly acquiring targets, and shooting accurately, and thus it reduces, in a big way, the enemy's ability to kill your squad mates and your teammates. So if you're a shooter in the support element, you need to suppress the enemy so that your attacking teammates can maneuver while the enemy's ability to engage them is reduced. If you achieve fire superiority, your squad mates and your teammates will be able to attack with little to no return fire being directed at them. Your enemies may not fear for their lives in game, but they also still don't want to die, lose, respawn. So they will try to avoid incoming fire on some level. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the machine gun kit 
because everyone knows that it's the kit most suited for suppression and support by fire. But the ICO has also made a lot of changes to the MG kit compared to Legacy Squad, which has seen a bit of controversy. I'm going to explain a bit about what I think the dev's intended role of the MG kit is in game, what the kit's strengths and weaknesses are, and how to work with those strengths and weaknesses to utilize the machine gun kit effectively. So to discuss this kit's weaknesses first, it has two major ones. First is that with the machine gun, it sucks at rapid responsive gameplay. I mean, just look at this. If you've played it, you know. You don't just suck at running and gunning with this, you just can't do it effectively. And that also means you won't be clearing any rooms with success. Second is that with the machine gun, even at range, it's very difficult to achieve pinpoint accuracy and kill individual targets with the post ICO machine guns. So now let's discuss a little bit about how we can work around these two weaknesses and still be effective with the MG kit and its intended role. The key to that is by leveraging the machine gun kit's strengths. What are its strengths? Well, one, it has a big belt capacity that allows it to fire for longer between reloads at the cost of having a longer reload. And OWI also gave its bullets more powerful suppressive ability. In addition, the bipod gives it a more stable firing platform than you would have without it. Yes, I know the bipod isn't perfect, but it does have one and it does improve the stability of your shooting. Now, let me explain to you two pieces of real world theory. First are area targets. Until this point, we've been mostly discussing what are called point targets. Right, we've been talking about engaging and suppressing individual enemies. Most FPS games have only this type of target engagement where all you have to do are shoot at specific, tangible, individual enemies. In real life, there are also what are called area targets, such as the length of a ditch an enemy squad occupies or the width of a tree line an enemy squad might be hiding behind. Area targets also exist in squad. It's just that nobody conceptualizes them in their normal gameplay, and so they're not really in the collective consciousness of the player base. Now let me explain some quick machine gun theory. When you shoot a machine gun, including in squad, you create what are called the cone of fire and the beaten zone. The cone of fire is basically the entire area along the line that you're shooting that your bullets saturate the air they travel through, except it's a slight cone because your rounds will also have dispersion the further along they fly. The beaten zone is the entire area on the ground within which your bullets impact the dirt. When you fire, anybody within one of these two areas is likely to be very suppressed and also has a very good chance of getting shot. The cone of fire and the beaten zone are area effects that can be very powerful in shaping the battlefield you're fighting in. If you use your machine gun and engage area targets, applying bursts of fire to cover the enemy in your cone of fire and or beaten zone, you essentially create an area effect that debuffs every enemy inside of it with squad's suppression VFX. You can apply these vision debuffs to entire enemy fire teams and squads, especially if you employ advanced techniques such as traversing fire or searching fire. The machine gun is the ultimate fire superiority machine for helping your squad conduct successful attacks and win firefights. The machine gun kit within the intended design of squad, the gameplay design, not in real life, is not primarily about you shooting guys and getting kills. It's about you helping your squad and team win the firefight and take the objective through the application of suppression and occasionally getting kills. Now, take a second to remember what I talked about earlier regarding suppression. The MG kit, just because it has a huge ammo capacity, is not an excuse to just dump a full belt of ammo at nothing and then complain when you get domed because you just gave away your position and sat in one place for too long. You still need to think about your suppressive fires. Think about known and suspected enemy locations that would most threaten your squad mates. And also, you need to reposition regularly so that you can stay alive. You as a machine gunner should also make sure you have a teammate to provide you with security because you are very weak in 1v1 fights. Alternatively, you can just stick with the squad so that you always have squad mates around you. You support the squad, but the squad also supports you 
depending on the circumstances. Now, if you are running a machine gun kit and you really need to engage point targets, so individual enemies out in the open, just use short aimed bursts. I'm talking two to three rounds. If you really need to fight up close and do something like clear a building or you're the last guy to clear out a hab, just pull out your pistol and pray for luck. You're not gonna see a super lot of success, but it's a hell of a lot better than relying on your machine gun. Now, one last note, it's very easy to lose fire superiority if you don't properly maintain distributed and sustained suppressive fire. So with the machine gun kit, that means that every time you fire off your belt and you have to reload, there's a big lull in the suppression that not only you generate, but your entire squad generates. Then your squad and your team is in danger of losing fire superiority and becoming the ones that are suppressed and subsequently killed. So it is critical for you as the machine gunner to communicate and coordinate your reloads to prevent this by using techniques such as talking guns or simply just shouting out, hey, I'm reloading so that one of your other squad mates can take up the slack. Now, in this video, I intentionally am not covering the automatic rifleman kits because I think all of their considerations are basically covered by what I've said about the machine gun kit here. They're just more rifle-like to varying degrees and as a result, easier to effectively utilize. Consider them as machine gun rifle hybrids. The last thing I'm going to talk about in this video is the designated marksman kit. Oh yes. This is the kit that is probably the biggest meme of all kits and squad because it is the most misunderstood. And it is associated with the very specific type of player that is stereotyped as trying to engage in spec ops recon gameplay. This type of player that often plays the marksman kit frustrates many squad players because what often happens is either the marksman ends up not working with the squad at all because they're astronomical units away from supporting anyone, even if they're trying to help in a scouting capacity, but they're actually just being useless, or the marksman ends up taking a valuable fire support slot that could have been filled by a more important kit like the grenadier or lat kit. Quick note, today I'm going to be talking about marksman kits. Nothing I say applies to sniper kits. The two are distinct and different. Not every faction has one, the other, or both. I am also going to talk about marksmen within the specific context of their role in support by fire. So I want you to think for a second about what we've discussed so far in this video regarding suppression, point versus area targets, and the machine gun kit's specialized role. How do you think the marksman kit fits into all this? The answer is that the marksman kit is another super specialized fire support kit like the machine gunner. They both suck at close quarters, they suck at fast gunplay, and they do best when shooting from a distance stationary. The difference is that the marksman is the complete opposite of the machine gun kit. The marksman specializes in engaging point targets by leveraging its unique strengths such as the high magnification optic and the bipod to shoot with high precision. It's all about increased precision to shoot specific guys. It's not primarily about being a long range shooter. Marksmen can engage at longer ranges more effectively than others, but that's more of a side effect than the primary goal here. As the marksman, you are able to kill or suppress point targets way more effectively than anybody else. What does this mean? It means that you as the marksman need to be very strategic and selective about who you decide to engage with your enhanced capabilities. For example, if your squad is supporting a friendly IFV and you see a tow emplacement among the enemies that you're fighting, you need to shoot the tow gunner and kill him as the marksman. Or if you can't kill him because you missed your first shot, you need to suppress him and keep him off the tow so that your friendly IFV can do its job unthreatened. What you should not do is be greedy and try to get a high kill count by turning your sights to all the other enemies around the toe emplacement and potentially allow the toe to damage the IFV, which would cause the IFV to withdraw and leave your squad with no armored support. That could lead to the failure of the entire offensive. Or even worse, you could cause the IFV to become disabled by the toe emplacement, which would force your squad to defend an immobile friendly IFV from being destroyed. These characteristics of the marksman kit also mean that it's most useful in relatively niche circumstances, with other kits being more useful in a broader range of situations. I mentioned the Grenadier kit and the Lat kit earlier. So you should always keep the needs and the mission of your squad in mind 
before you pick your kit. Remember, it's all about teamwork, it's not about you. And of course, the general principles of fire and maneuver and suppressing the enemy by engaging known and suspected enemy locations all apply to the marksman kit. You are able to suppress a specific target way better than anyone else. And if need me, kill specific enemies with surgical precision. This means that you need to be with the squad and work with the squad. You support the squad and the squad supports you. And you can be a positive contributor to the team. In this video, I laid out some real world concepts and then applied them to squad's new infantry combat overhaul in a way that is useful and which I hope helps some players to solve a lot of the challenges that they've been facing with the 6.0 update. This was a very basic treatment that ignored other very important weapons and kits like the grenadier and his grenade launcher which can launch high explosive and smoke grenades at the enemy. I will probably cover that separately in a later video. It's important to remember that everything in this video is all theory and that it's a lot harder to put something into practice than it is to think about it and then talk about it in a YouTube video. Things are never going to work out perfectly in practice. So ultimately, your ability to problem solve, adapt, and apply practical solutions in game matters the most. So consider this video as a common framework and a starting point for effective tactics in game rather than as a bible. The infantry combat overhaul is still very new and I'm also still learning its mechanics and getting used to them. So everything I've said here needs to be discussed. I welcome your comments and replies down below. Having covered the support by fire side of the equation in this video, Going forward, I want to go more into depth about the assault side of the equation. What do you need to do? How do you need to do it if you're one of the guys that's maneuvering up towards the objective and assaulting the bad guys? Because no matter how much fire support you have, you will still need to move and shoot and clear out objectives with your FPS gun skills in close combat. Let me know if there are any other topics that you think are worth discussing. For example, anti-tank tactics. Now that the challenge posed by vehicles against infantry is much greater now than ever. See you later.